as we continue our sermon series in that book. Last week, we were in Hebrews 3, 7 through 11, and we saw the command of our Lord, do not harden your heart. One that's taken from Psalm 95. We saw that this was much more than a mere theoretical danger. It happened that an entire generation of God's people hardened their heart and were not allowed to enter into God's rest as a result. Unbelief is not due to a lack of evidence because this generation was the one that was brought out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God. They saw all the signs and wonders that God performed upon Egypt. Moses would say, tomorrow this will happen. And that is exactly what happened again and again. They saw that. They saw that the Lord was sovereign over all things. He brought down the mightiest nation of the world in order to let his people go. Then they part, he, he opened the Red Sea and they went across. They saw all of this. There was no doubt to them that God was and that he was doing these things. But nevertheless, sin is such in us that even though the evidence is clear, we harden our hearts against God. Unbelief is always a hardening of heart because there is more than sufficient evidence of God. Even through creation itself, the whole creation screams out in testimony of God and anyone who denies that suppresses the truth because we have wicked hearts that turn away from God and that wish to suppress the truth. So it's due, unbelief is due to a rebellious heart that refuses to accept the truth when it comes to us from God in the ways that it comes, whether natural revelation initially through things that he's made, or we hear the voice of God when we come and are exposed to the word of God and the prophets that have spoken through the word. So again, last week we saw the command do not harden your heart. Okay, that brings ruin. If you harden your heart against God, you resist His voice. Now today, we're going to uh, look at Hebrews 3, 12 through 15, and we see the command to exhort one another lest we harden our heart. So you see, we're, we're to do something to help others not to harden their heart, and especially among the people who profess to be the Lord's people, those people that we have communion with in the Lord and fellowship with. We have a responsibility here. So please listen carefully as I read today's text to you because as always, it is from the Holy Word of God. It is His Word that He has given to us. This is what God says to us. People say, I wish God would would just speak to me. This is how He has chosen to speak to us through His Holy Word. So give ear to the word. Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Thanks be to God for his holy and infallible word. May he add his blessing to his word that we might understand it and that we might appropriate that we might bring it into our lives. So the first thing we see here is that we're to be on the lookout for unbelieving hearts among us. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you, among you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Beware, brethren. This is a clear call to be on the lookout for an unbelieving heart, for a hardening hardening heart. The word beware means to see, like to Take notice of it, to observe it, be on the lookout for it. There's no place for sluggishness here. It's a word that speaks of an alertness, of an eagerness to to search it out. We're to watch out for an evil God-resisting heart the same way that if you were in a jungle that was infested with 
poisonous snakes. You would be on the, the lookout. You'd, you, you'd look out because there's danger. And if unbelieving heart, there's even a greater danger. Or the way you would be if you heard that there was a, a serial killer about and you were in a parking garage and he'd been haunting parking garages. You'd, you'd be very watching and looking to make sure. We need to be eager to see because this is a serious issue. If we see a brother starting to harden their heart, they're on a trajectory going away from God, apostatizing from God. And we need to be alert to that. It's even worse to, to see it and pretend that you don't see it. We know how it talks about, like in Deuteronomy, when you, know, you see your neighbor and he's struggling with his ox, it's fallen into the ditch, and you kind of walk by because you don't want him to know you saw him because you don't want to get involved. You don't want to deal with anything. And we can see somebody hardening heart, going astray. We don't want to get involved. So we kind of act like we didn't notice it. We didn't, we didn't really see that. Or a parent, you know, with a misbehaving child and he's tired, doesn't want to deal with it. Or he just kind of acts like he didn't see it. Go on with everything. We're to be ever on the lookout for an evil heart. It's the source of ruin to many a soul to, for eternity. People go to hell because of a hardened, unbelieving heart. And note the word brethren. We're not looking for an evil heart among those outside the church. Those, we're, we're looking for this within the church. Is there an evil, unbelieving heart among us? Not that we don't care about unbelievers outside the church. Of course we do. We want to reach out to them. We want, but we know that those who don't profess Christ have an unbelieving heart. They have an evil, unbelieving heart. Of course they do. But we're looking out for it among those who say that they're trusting in the Lord and that He is their Lord and Savior and that they're, they're following Him. See, th this text is calling us to look out for the heart among our brothers and to those who profess to be brothers, you see, the Bible always calls people by what they call themselves. And Jesus makes the distinction many times when he says, you know, okay, you're my disciples, but you're only my disciples indeed if you, have, if you really believe, if, if you truly trust in me. He makes the distinction between those who are just outwardly connected and those who are truly regenerate and born again. The very people that God brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand, as I mentioned earlier, had wicked, unbelieving hearts. And they perished in the wilderness. They were marked out as God's people. They had the sign of circumcision upon them. They had partaken of the Passover. And they had wicked, unbelieving hearts. That's what we're told. It's an illustration to us that there are people among the professing people of God who have wicked, unbelieving hearts. And so we need to be on the lookout. It's not just a, a theoretical thing. It is a real thing. They end up not entering into God's rest in the end. Jesus says, many will come to me in that day of, day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And so on and so on. And he'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. So we need to watch out for this. See how this unbelieving heart is described. It's said to be an evil heart. Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. He says, who can even know it? We don't even know the depths of the evil that is in our heart. We, we have such a heart by nature. That's, that's, what we, that, that's how we were brought forth. When we came from our parents, we were brought forth in sin because sin has passed on all the human race. Our, our first father, Adam, represented us all and he rebelled. And so we're all brought forth. He's, he's a viper, and we're all brought forth as vipers as a result. We all have a heart, by, this heart by nature, unless the Lord by His grace takes away, as the Scripture says, our stony heart and gives us a responsive heart, a heart of flesh. Unless He takes our heart that is spiritually dead and cannot respond to Him and gives us a heart that can respond to Him. People won't respond to the Lord. They'll continue to harden their heart against Him until he circumcises our heart, as the scripture says. It's a heart that hates its own maker and that rejects him. Every unbeliever has such a heart. No matter how nice they may appear to be, they are in fact at war 
with their Creator. And nothing could be more wicked than that. I had an atheist one time when uh, I was reading a book and he was, he was just taking a blood sample, it was at the uh, blood clinic or whatever, and he, he said, uh, he saw my book and he said, you know, atheists can be moral people too. And I said, is that so? I said, the greatest commandment is we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. How can you be moral if you don't keep the greatest commandment? He said, I guess that's true. And it certainly is, isn't it? It's a depraved heart. On the day of judgment, sinners will be turned over to their own way. It's those who wickedly resist and rebel against God. And they will be brought to what they really are. The restraints will be taken off. We have lots of things that restrain us now. What would happen if you had unlimited power and you could do whatever you wanted? What wickedness would you commit? We're, we're restrained, you see. We, we, this, this, is, this is who we are, rejectors of God. If we are those who have been renewed by Christ, though, then we will see clearly in that day of judgment that we're no different except by the grace of God. That it's only because of His change, transformation of us that we have been born again and that we have been able to come and believe and, and to be changed by the power of God. That's why we come. We come to the Lord to be saved, to be forgiven of our sins, and then to be transformed and cleansed from our sins. He's the only one that can do that. And we will marvel in that day that God should have cared so much for us, that He should have forgiven us, and that He should renew us, transform us. But there may be among those who profess, you see, to be saved, those who are not saved, and who therefore there may be among us an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We need to be aware that such a heart is not in us, or in our brethren. The heart of unbelief is also said to be, as I've mentioned, a heart that departs from the living God. Now this is interesting. The Greek word that's used here is the word that we get the word apostasy from. You may have heard that word. Someone who once was with God and then they apostatize. They turn away from Him by hardening their heart. Here's one you see who outwardly has come to God and been reconciled to Him. So the unbelievers that have never professed the Lord they're not apostates in that sense. They've never come into the church and said that they were following God and then gone out. This is one who had taken his place among the redeemed and the sanctified. He had professed to believe on the Lord Jesus for his salvation. But there he is, departing from the one true living God. To use the language of the Old Testament, God says in Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So the one who gives living water to give life, eternal life to them, they have rejected. That's the first thing. They, and the second thing they've done is they've sought other things to give them salvation that can't do it. Why would you leave the true God in order to go for something that cannot save you, that can't help you, other gods? What a wretched and foolish and stupid thing it is to walk away from the living God. How can anyone do such a thing, you see? The one in, uh, who alone can give blessing and eternal life. Think of it. God also says in Jeremiah 2.11, Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory. He's talking about himself, their God. For what does not profit? You know, you hear of desperate people in North Korea who are defectors. That makes sense, doesn't it? They want to get away. They want to go where they can have liberty. And, but, but how is it that anyone who comes into communion and fellowship with the living God could be a defector from Him? From the Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins in order that we might be saved. Yet it happens. And we're to look out for it, for the beginnings of it, for the evidences of it. We're to be alert to it. Remarkably, this is something that even true believers do at times in that they take steps in that direction. We all know that. We all do that. But the difference with a true believer, he has a new heart and he will not utterly depart. He may do like David did. He may go very far into his sin. But he will recover. He will not utterly depart. If they do not stop departing, 
then this passage here shows us that they are those who never really were partakers of Christ. If we are partakers of Christ, then we will continue, you see. Their departing at first looks just like the departing of the one who in fact is an unbeliever. The truth is we can't tell the difference. The difference is one of them is going to hear and return. The other one is going to go on resisting. And in the last day it will be manifest. The true believer has the, the seed of new life and the spirit of God is in him. And he will repent. The unbeliever will only repent if he becomes a believer, which is wonderful. So if you go, you don't have to know whether this person is actually, you can't see their heart. You don't have to know whether they're actually an unbeliever or a believer. If you see someone departing from God, you go to them. If they're a believer, then you're going to be part of the solution to bring them back. If they're an unbeliever, then maybe they'll become a believer. They may not. You know, they may go on into their error. But you see, here's the thing. We don't know if our brother who is departing is a believer or an unbeliever but we're to do what we can to stop him. Okay? That's what we're told in this passage. Our Lord commands us to exhort each other daily so as to keep each other from departing. You can see what he says about that in verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Notice what the goal is. It is to keep each other from being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's the goal. If you have been a Christian for long, you have had the heartbreaking experience of seeing someone that you once walked with in the church. Maybe you were even close to them. Maybe you even had sweet fellowship and communion with them, and they departed from the living God. Perhaps you've asked yourself, what might I have done to prevent that one from doing that? What might I have said? What might I have done? Now, you would like it very much if I told you that, well, there is absolutely nothing that you could have done. You would like it if I explained that your brother has to answer for himself, which is certainly true. Ultimately, he is responsible, though, and, and though he might try to blame his former brethren, he is the one who departed from the living God. He's the one who hardened his heart, and his punishment will be most severe for doing so much more severe than if he had never professed to start with. You would like it if I entirely excused you from all responsibility concerning your brother. But this passage won't let me do that because this passage has a duty. This text will not let me do that. It, it will make me ask you if you did what God here tells you to do, lest your brother should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If you turned away and ignored it, then you have some blame for that. If you were in a position to do this and you did not do this, then you did not follow what God says. You are not the cause of your brother's defection, but you're to be blamed for not doing what God told you to do to prevent his defection. So let's examine what the Lord tells us to do lest our brother be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. He tells us again, Right to our text, to exhort one another daily. The word translated exhort is a very comprehensive word. See, we're, before I get to that, though, we're to continually conduct ourselves toward each other, lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It says that we're to do this daily while it's called today as long as it is today while we would hear the voice of God before it's too late, as long as we have His Word of so great a salvation that at first was spoken by the Lord and then confirmed by those who heard Him, as long as we have that Word in our presence, God's Word you know, speaking to us, access to it that we can speak to, to our brother, as long as it's today. But what does it mean to exhort one another then? Well, the word translated exhort is comprehensive. It's the word parakalao in the original. Para means beside. And kalao means to call. So the picture here is one who comes to your side, called to your side to speak to you, to speak into your life, to say what needs to be said. It can be 
to plead with you what the occasion requires. It can be to urge you. It can be to beg you. It's often translated that way, beseech and such words. To comfort you. It's a very different idea, isn't it? To rebuke you. To encourage you. To instruct you. To warn you. To correct you. To admonish you. All, it can be all sorts of what, whatever is needed. You come and speak what is needed. Always with a view to helping. The Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, coming from this word, because He's the one that, that exhorts us. He's the one that admonishes us. That word is sometimes translated helper or comforter, like in uh, John 14. The one who does this then is the paraclete. And so you see if your brother is doing well, then you're going to encourage him to keep on going. You know, just stay, stay with it. If he's ignorant, you're going to instruct him. Maybe he doesn't understand some of God's commandments and he's, he's disobeying God, doesn't even realize what he's doing. If he's in danger, you're going to admonish him and warn him. Say, watch out, be careful. There's a snare ahead of you. If he's troubled by the death of a loved one, you're going to go and comfort him. Wh whatever is needed. If he's sinning, you go to rebuke him. If he's weary, you go to support him, help him out, hold him up. And you see in particular, what we're looking at here, what happens if he's departing from the Lord? Why is this word ex translated exhort here? Because that's what we do. We go to exhort him. We go to call him away from departing from the Lord. You're to seek to prevent him from hardening his heart. Now, our gracious Lord tells us that by exhorting each other daily, we really do keep each other from being hardened. You know, the Lord Jesus really stressed this. He said, if there's one sheep going astray, you leave the 99 to go after the one that's going astray. He tells us, if you see your brother in sin, then you go to him and restore him. This is something that he tell, Jesus tells us because it's so important. And, and here he's telling us that by exhorting each other daily, we really do keep our brother from being hardened. It says to do this lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. These words help us to understand how the exhortations work, how they can help when a brother is being hardened. It says being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Think again about how hardening works. Okay, we, look, we looked at this last week. How does hardening work? What happens? It happens when you hear God's voice and you resist it. You, you don't like what it say, and you resist it. You push it away. You're starting to harden yourself. And then you're starting to deceive yourself because you want to say it's okay. His word comes to you with thousands of applications. Okay, I mean, his word is revealed to us in the Holy Scripture, but we take that word and it comes to us in our lives in thousands of situations. And we either harden ourselves and resist or responding to the Lord and walking with him and communing with him. And then you deceive yourself if you harden yourself that what you're doing is not that bad. And, and you begin to justify it, and you go on like that. That's how hardening works, and it prog is progressive. Let's look at some everyday examples of how the hardening works, how it begins. Maybe your daughter breaks out in an angry way, rage against her little brother. You see it, and you know that you should correct her. God's voice says so. He says that we're to, you know, take responsibility for our children, that we're to discipline them in the, the, the Lord. His word tells you to correct them, but, but, but you resist. You've just hardened your heart, right? Because you don't want to be bothered with it. You hardened your heart to what God told you to do. And because we all like to feel good about ourselves, then you start to justify yourself. You do this through the whole process. What do you do? Instead of repenting, you begin to rationalize and you say that, well, I, I really need to give her some space. You, know, that you don't want to be overbearing you know, it would be wrong to be overbearing. When it, of course, yeah, it would be wrong to be overbearing. And you don't want to damage your relationship with her. Maybe you add that you're tired and you need to relax because it's been a really hard day and you might not handle it right if you went to. So, so you're going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. It's just a little thing you see. But what are you doing? You're hardening your heart and you're being deceived. You're deceiving yourself that what you did was good and acceptable. And until you come and say, hey, you know what? That wasn't right. And you're still in that deception. You're, you're hardening yourself through the deceitfulness of sin. Maybe, a whole different illustration. Maybe you're a student in university. 
you're in your classes and you're constantly hearing and within the whole community uh, that you know, sex between two consenting adults is perfectly acceptable, whether they're the same gender or different genders, whether they're married or not married, none of that matters. And this seems to be the view of all your fellow students. You're kind of the oddball. You hear them harshly criticizing anyone that, that has a different view. And you know that, you know that what you have believed is, is not just your opinion. You know that it's true, that it's what God's word says. But you start to entertain the lie that, oh, this is just my opinion. Oh, I have my opinion, you have your opinion, and you know, one opinion is as good as another opinion. I think this way, you think that. It, you're starting to harden yourself. You want to fit in. You don't want to have the tension. You become then confused about what the Bible says. I, I don't quite understand these passages here. What do these really mean? And then you start to look things up and you find someone that says, oh, what this really means, and they give you some things and you start to feed on that. And you say, you know, I really don't understand that anymore. That's not true. You know exactly what it says and what it means. Now, you might convince yourself it's a deceived heart. Do you see where it goes? That's how the heart is, it, it deceives itself. You have just hardened your heart and deceived yourself. Somebody comes and says, oh, you know, I'm not sure about, a lot of times that's an indication of a hard heart. Sometimes they're really grappling with something. Now let's look at an entirely different situation again. You're tired and feeling sorry for yourself after a hard day at work. You come home, you come in, and you know, the kids have made uh, tents with the furniture. You know, they've got, got blankets you know, stretched across and all the furniture is kind of rearranged all over the place and you're kind of stumbling through the house trying, trying to get around. You blow it up at them because you're irritated. And then you get in a fight with your wife because she comes and tries to talk to you and you get angry with her as well and you know that you have sinned. But instead of repenting, you start to think about how well, they haven't really been listening to me, and I really needed to speak strongly to them like that. And Jesus got angry with the money changers, and you, you start to justify what you've done. And uh, they need to be corrected with a firmer voice because they've not been listening to me. And besides, you had a hard day, and they should respect that, and they should recognize that you had a hard day. You're deceiving yourself. As if you didn't do wrong when you did do wrong. We all have that natural tendency to put ourselves in the best light instead of receiving God's raw word so that it speaks directly into our lives and we respond to it. What happens when you see your brother hardening yourself, hardening himself, and you exhort him? By God's grace, by your words, you cause the light of God's word to shine into his life. You expose his sin to him. He may resist you and oppose you, and he may argue with you, but you have brought the light to bear upon him, and that is good. It may be time, some time before he responds, but you have brought the light. You may have to wait, and you may have to try again, but once he yields, you have gained your brother. That's what Jesus says. Your brother sins, you rebuke him, and if he repents, you have gained your brother. You have brought God's light into his life when he was in the darkness, when he was deceiving himself, when he was hiding. He is able to respond to God's voice now instead of continuing to harden himself. Do you see how this works? God uses us to wake each other up, to shine his light so that we can see what is true, and we can be delivered from our deceptions. The truth is not so confusing as we make it out to be. It's actually quite clear. Sometimes you can be guilty of doing something that is quite wrong, and you've been justifying yourself. It's clearly what David was doing when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he tried to cover it up by putting her husband in harm's way before Israel's enemies. 
you know, you come up with just, you know, well, you know, I need to have a good example to the people, and so I need to cover this up because, you know, he's going, you know, whatever, you know, you're doing all this stuff and make yourself out to be much be better off than what you are. He needed to hear Nathan say, you killed Uriah the Hittite. You know, this is just how it is. And you took his wife to be your wife. As soon as another person brings it up, what happens? The lights switch on. You know, I remember uh, dealing with someone who had embezzled a big pile of money from a church. And when we came to him, lights were on. And he could see what he did clearly in a way that he couldn't see it before. And that's what happens when you do as Nathan did here with David. It, 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 it wakes, wakes up a person. As soon as another per person brings it up, you can see what you are denying. And there's often a great relief when that happens. Because now you can have communion with the Lord again. You were avoiding Him. And now you can have communion with the Lord again. And you can repent and you can deal with it. And you can have joyful communion instead of that kind of shrouded alienation from God that you were, you were having before. It was not, no good. You realize what you've been missing and what a fool you were. I could have been walking with the Lord all this time. Why did I, why did I harden my heart and why did I deceive myself? Go to your brother when you see him in error. You have the power to wake him up. God calls you. He tells you to go and exhort him to speak into his life. Again, there are thousands of illustrations that we can employ. But the point is that you are not to leave your brother to continue hardening his heart and deceiving himself. Don't let, his excuse, don't, don't let him use his excuses and rationalizations either when you go to him. Maybe he responds and he acknowledges it, but he's going to bring up, very likely, he may bring up excuses and rationalizations. You'll be tempted to let him do that because it's kind of polite, isn't it? You know, he's, he's saying, oh, wow, well, you see this and this. And he's giving you explanation. You're tempted to say, oh, yeah. You know, and, and kind of let, let him off you know, a little bit, but uh, you ought not. To allow him to minimize his sin is not what he needs right now. Remember, that's how sin worked in the first place to deceive him. Your role is not to make him feel better by letting him hold on to his deceptions, but to bring him before the face of the Lord so that he can feel better in the grace of God and the salvation and mercy of Jesus Christ rather than in his self-justifications, his excuses for sin. You are there to bring God's light to him, to remove the deception that he has fallen under so that he can respond to God's voice. Exhort him from God's word. Bring the truth to bear on him and don't let him worm his way out of it. Now, of course, you can acknowledge that there may have been some great difficulties and trials and that put him in a place where it was very, very difficult for him. But the sin was still sin, and he needs to see it for what it truly is. This passage has made me see that I have been lax in doing that sort of thing, and I want to rectify that. We're not ever to be harsh, but neither are we to compromise. Do we want to leave our brother with a heart that is departing from the living God? Do we want to leave him in that place? He may not listen to us again, but we need to at least do the best we can to turn him from his sin. James concludes his whole epistle with these words, James 5, 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Is that not what Nathan the prophet did with David? Is that not what parents need to do every day with their children? Is that not what we all need to do and be doing with each other? What a wonderful thing it is that the Lord uses us to keep each other from departing from Him. We certainly take note of the times when we have exhorted someone and it has failed. I mean, that really stands out. There are times when you've gone and taught and it failed. They didn't, they didn't repent. Maybe it's been 25 years and they still haven't repented. But are there not many more times when it has succeeded? And by the way, I haven't been in the ministry for so long. I know of times when I've gotten calls from people that minister, I ministered to you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And they say, you know, I get it now. And they, they remember and they finally have repented. You see, but are there not many times when it has succeeded? 
because we don't notice those times as much because they were starting to depart and then they came back. And it was like, that was wonderful. But where would, it, where would have they gone if they kept going down that trajectory? When the person you spoke to heard you and turned from their destructive way, it was a wonderful thing. Have you not helped those who are being drawn into sin to avoid it? And have you not also helped those who have become entangled in sin and its deception to get out of it when they had been overtaken with it? What a wonderful thing it is when we can make such a difference. Verse 14 reminds us that if we are truly partakers of Christ, we will continue in our confidence in Him, our faith in Him, and really is what that's getting at, until the end. We will continue to lean on Jesus Christ, to trust in Him and rely upon Him for our salvation to the end. It doesn't mean that there won't be times when we're weak and wavering, but that, over, that, that faith will be there and it will continue. It means that for those who truly are in Christ with saving faith, that they will not utterly depart from Him. They may start down that path, but they will not utterly depart from Him. They know there is no Savior, no other truth, no other Savior, than, no other truth than His truth, no other salvation than His salvation. Our exhortation may or may not have a good effect on the one who is not a true partaker of Christ, not truly in Christ. Sometimes it will. It will lead him to salvation, as I said. But in the case of those who are true partakers of Christ, this passage shows us that we will have a part in their restoration. It may not be directly from our interaction, but we will be a part of that restoration along with many other things that God will use. Even if they resist you at first, you have a restoring effect. God will use your exhortations along with these other things to eventually bring the believer back. That should be, I tell you that, because that should be a grand motivation to you to go. Because God actually uses these things to make it happen. He actually uses these things. God does not do things in a vacuum. He does things, He doesn't just zap people. He works through situations and lives and many different people doing things. And we are a part of that restoration, he tells us so right here in this passage. It is a motivation to us to do what is said here because it is effective. We need to act quickly before the hardening is complete and the individual is shown to have been an unbeliever all along, perhaps. Verse 15 says we're to do it while it is said today. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So we do it while God is still speaking, in the times when God is still speaking. You do it before the opportunity to speak is past. Now, Satan will make every effort to get you to not do this, to put it off, to not go to your brother. Don't let him succeed in stopping you. If you don't go, you become part of the problem because now you also are resisting the voice of God. How else do you think it is that entire churches can become apostate? How do they get to where they once had a sound confession of faith and now they have ministers that, believe, that, that don't believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead, that are immoral, that are, they're teaching immorality, they're promoting it, denying miracles. Uh, how did that happen? How did a whole great denominations have that happen? This right here. People hardened their heart. They started down that trajectory. And other people saw it. They were concerned, but they, they, they let it go. And then after what? So they hardened their hearts. The whole community hardened their heart together. And the whole community went to ruin. That's what happened when Israel came out of the wilderness. The whole community except Joshua and Caleb and a few others, went hard in their hearts and went to ruin. Resisting the voice of God, then, we need to see is not just an individual thing. It is also a community thing. We are part of a community. We're part of the fellowship of God's people. Responding to the Lord is also a community thing. And we do that together. The question is, what is my part in this? Are you resisting God's voice yourself? Or are you responding to God's voice? Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. God has given us churches, and He has commanded us to be an active part of them. 
not to pull each, he's not given us churches to pull each other down where we're deceiving ourselves and justifying ourselves that, that we can save ourselves, that we're good people, all, all those kind of things, but rather where we're pointing each other to the only Savior and we're resting in Him and walking in Him in the light of God's truth, building one another up in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand and let's call on the Lord. Lord God, we have before us, we, we have heard today from your holy word an exhortation to exhort. And Father, we know that this is not an easy thing for us, but we see that it is an important thing. Father, that when we see a brother who is hardening his heart, that we need to go to that brother and we need to endeavor to restore him. We don't have to be some great theologian or something. We can just simply... Call him to return to the Lord, to return to the light. We thank you so much, Lord, for the way that you use your light when it shines into the lives of your people. We thank you, Lord, that it's a very potent and powerful thing. We thank you that you have made us part of this whole process. And we pray, Father, that we would be faithful because it's something that you have asked us to do and it's a way that we show our love to you and our love to our brothers and sisters. We have a body for a reason, a body of, of uh, a church. We have communion with each other's gifts and graces. And we pray, Lord, that we would live in a way that's pleasing to you within that community, that we would not, we would not be contributing to deception and hardening, but to responsiveness to the Lord and communion and walking with him. Oh, Father, we need your help. We, 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 can see, we can see thousands of ways that we have fallen short. And that's really what the light is all about. That it's not we walk in the light and then we don't have any sin. But it's that we walk in the light and we see how much we need Jesus as our Savior. We see how much we need His grace and how much we need to be strengthened by Him. And so, Lord, here we are. We're presenting ourselves to you as sinners, asking you, Lord, to have mercy on us. That's the prayer that you delight in. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And we pray, Father, that you would be pleased to do so and that we would, as your grace works in us, be able more and more to turn from our sin and to walk more and more with you, that we would not go the other way, that we would not go in the way of hardening, but we would go in the way of tenderness before you, trembling before your word, that we would be those who are open and who are receiving from you, O Lord, your light and your counsel and who are encouraging others to do the same. Thank you, Lord, that you have made it possible for sinners like us to do that because it would be impossible without your grace and salvation. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please be seated. Let's prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. And people of God, receive now the blessing of God. It's, it's your blessing in Jesus Christ if you're trusting in him. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.